first. Got it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning uh, lifelike Bible study of the life of David. And as always, this is not just Bible study, it's worship because we are in the presence of the triune God. And uh, let's give him thanks and praise with song and prayer. And we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'll prepare to sing our opening hymn. And I'll put that on the screen if you give me just uh, a moment. Beautiful song, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, done beautifully too. We'll continue on with our time of worship uh, with uh, responsibly reading the intro. I do the light colored font and you respond with the dark colored. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given a command to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness. And comfort me again. I will also praise you with the heart for your faithfulness, O oh my God. I will sing praises to you with you, O oh Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. My soul also shall wait for you. And my tongue will talk of your righteousness help all the day long. <clears throat> and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continue. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you as your precious children, made so by the love of Christ and all that he has done for us on the cross to clear the path so that we're no longer at enmity with you, but are your dear precious children. As such, you give us the right to come into your presence and unburden our hearts and our minds with those things that trouble us. And so we lift up those things to you this morning that concern us, knowing that you will care for them and you will answer them in the way that is best for all concerned. Heavenly Father, we lift up our brother and sister, Joe and Connie Rao. Be with Joe as he goes through rehab. Bring him and Connie here safely home. Be with the doctors as they investigate what might be done for his cancer. Lord, in your mercy. Your yeah. Prayer. Yeah. Be with Jack. <clears throat> have a good report from the doctor. And may he have continued healing. May they find the cancer in remission or gone. Be with Joe. Be with both of them, no matter what the doctors find. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our Hear our we ask you to be with Terry and all those who are traveling at this time of year. Grant them safe trip to their destination and bring them safely home. Lord, in your mercy, Hear Hear our our be with our brother Tom as he awaits a CT scan. We ask that the uh, results might be positive, that uh, no uh, procedures would be needed, but Lord, in his life, bring whatever is needed for him to regain and keep complete health. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with our dear brother, Reverend Art. Be with him amidst his heart problems and the associated symptoms that he's having. Grant the doctor's wisdom from his heart monitor and all the tests that he's taking, that they would be able to move forward and restore him to health. You working through whatever means necessary. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we lift up Rachel and Deshaun. We ask that you would plant forgiveness in their hearts and do so by planting your Holy Spirit. Grant them the faith to believe in you and the understanding that we are all God's precious children. Grant them a loving heart. Be with them. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with Karen. Uh, we ask for continued improvement upon her shoulder and grant her patience to wait while you work that out. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with all of us as we attend the district conference this coming week. Grant us wisdom, grace, patience, and understanding. And what all that we decide and all that we say and whatever we do, may it be your will. May you make the Michigan District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri, send it your tool to proclaim the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with all those suffering through this heat wave across the country, both here and other parts of the land. Be with those farmers that have lost livestock. Be with people that don't have a home and, and are out in the, in, the, in the hot air. Be with those that don't have air conditioning. Provide fans and provide cooling centers. Watch over all, Lord, that no one might perish in this heat. And when it's your time, Lord, and you know it's best, give us relief. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with me. Grant me healing and restoration, head to toe, body and soul, that I may continue to be your voice here, your shepherd. Grant me your spirit and your strength. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. All these things we commend over to you, gracious Father, in the name of your dear Son, with the Holy Spirit entering into our hearts, and in all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. We pray the uh, collect of the day. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Cast out all sins and evil desires from us. And pour into our hearts your Holy Spirit to guide us into all blessedness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. We are on session four, day three of your study guide. And the appointed uh, lesson before Samuel chapter 3. So I will put that on the screen. Yeah. 
And start off with your, if somebody could read verse uh, one through five. Second Samuel three verses one through five. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon and Hinnomim of Jezreel. And his second, Chilib, Chilib of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And the third, Absalom, the son of Mecca, the daughter of Talmai, king of Jeshur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And the fifth, Shephethah, the son of Abathal, and the sixth, Isriam of Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Very good. You know, you probably picked one of the harder readings that we're going to read today. You did a good job on those names. I almost volunteered for that. That's what I started reading. <laughs> and you know, as far as names go, as far as I'm considered, you know, get David right, get Saul right. But the rest of these are all dead. They don't care. I missed Just a little... say it with confidence. <laughs> I missed a little bit with... I'm so old, with, 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 uh, I'll, I'll, put, uh, I'll put a couple of Ron and Tom in this group too. We used to have those little uh, uh, accent marks that helped us pronounce the words, even the names. And I, I missed that. I, they can depend on it. Yeah. So, sorry. No, no, no problem. Me. So where we're at here, um, Saul's been chasing David throughout the wilderness. Saul is dead now. Uh, he died in battle. He committed suicide. And uh, David has been made king of uh, Judah, the, the one southern tribe. And the nation right now has been split. Um, all the rest of the tribes are kind of the northern tribes of Israel. And um, there's a civil war going on. Uh, there's been battles. And um, so the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, um, who's getting stronger and who's getting weaker? Okay. Yeah. So he's kind of winning. And uh, uh, the rest of the tribes are kind of losing, even though it's basically one tribe against 11. Uh, and then what do you notice here? Uh, what's been happening with David? What's he been busy doing? Having children. Having children. <laughs> Having children with different ones. Everybody. <laughs> Good, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Basically with everybody. 15 million. Is these all his wives or just? Wives and concubines. Is this in keeping with the Lord's will, do you think? No. How do you know? If I was questioning you, what could you cite to? Uh, well, from the Bible. Adam and Eve, there was one man and one woman. Yeah. And it didn't change until they did. That's, that's the message going forward, and it always has been through the Bible. And there's been, you know, a number of uh, godly men that have had more than one wife. Jacob? Moses. Right? Who, what was that, Reverend Arnold? Moses. 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 That doesn't make it right, though, does it? No. That's right. And you think about Jacob, because Jacob had Leah and Rachel. And had kids by both wives. So those were the, the 12 tribes of Israel. How'd that work out? How was that family dynamic? Do you remember? What happened to uh, what no. happened to Joseph? Yeah, and Jacob and his brothers, uh, Joseph was the favorite son because he was of the son, I think, of Rachel. Yeah. And the other brothers got, well, you know the rest of the story, the coat and the jealousy. So good. Yeah, not good. And that there, there you see it's not God's will. And, uh, you know, he doesn't punish David. He doesn't send him to hell. He doesn't take the kingdom away from him. But as we'll go on and see, things aren't going to work out well for him because of this. And he's going to encounter problems along the way. Jesus, Pastor, do we know, like, in the Bible when that started to happen? Like, I was thinking Noah, when he went in the ark, it was still... I don't know, but it may be after the ark, after the flood. I don't know. Does the Bible give us an indicator of what, uh, what it was the polygamy or whatever started to crop into the called people of God? I think uh, before Noah's time, if you look back, <clears throat> that history of people leading up to Noah, I think one of uh, 
one of Cain's descendants had two wives, but I don't remember whose name was off the top of my head. Cain would not be a good um, one to look look at for uh, living a godly life. He he pretty much from him came all the people that fell away and were the reason why there had to be a flood because they all turned evil. All right, let's uh, continue on and read uh, verses now. Let's go 6 through 21. Mm -hmm. I'll try it. Sure. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. You remember who was Abner? You guys remember who Abner is? Right hand man of Saul. It's general. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah and the daughter of Aya. And Ishabeth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? And who is Ishabeth? The son of Saul. And also the what of the northern king? Northern king. He's the king of the northern kingdom. All right. Uh, I'll try not to stop you again. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth, and was very angry over the word Ish Ishabeth, and was very angry. I'm going to keep repeating it, and said, "Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day, I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers, and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David. And yet, you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman." God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word, because he feared him. Let's stop there for just a moment. What has Abner done to make uh, Ishbosheth upset? And what did Ishbosheth do to make Abner upset? Didn't Abner accuse him of sleeping with Saul's concubine? Right. Which would be equivalent to claiming the throne, kind of. Yeah. So it's if like a power, power struggle through. It, it, it's a power thing, right. Power place. Ishbosheth says, hey, you slept with my father's concubine, which basically is saying, you're trying to steal the power and the throne from me. <clears throat> Does Abner deny he did that? Doesn't really deny it, does he? He's upset. He says, you charge me with a fault concerning a woman. You charge me that something I did was wrong. But he's kind of skirting all the way. Kind of like a guy getting caught stealing. And he says, how dare you accuse me of stealing? Yeah. I was going to pay for this. I just forgot. <laughs> um, and uh, so what, what does this move Abner to do? Verses oh, 9 and 10. Huh? Yeah. yeah. If this is the way you're going to treat me, I'm going to work on making David king. The heck with you. And who we know, is this Bosheth really, is, is he really in charge? Is he really in control? No. He's, yeah. Abner's installed him because he's the last remaining um, relative of Saul. He could become king. But the power behind the throne is Abner. And so with that in mind, do you think maybe Abner really did sleep with a concubine? Yeah, he, that's what he wants. He wants power. But now it's been thrown out there. And now Abner's offended and his honor's offended. So now he says, well, fine. You're going to treat me this way? Let's make David king. He does. And Ishbosheth doesn't do anything. Why? Here. Yeah. Rightly so, he's a puppet, right? He doesn't, he knows. Yeah. He knows why he's king and he knows who's the power behind the throne. Yeah. All right, I think we left off at 11, so uh, 12 on, and I'll try to let you read through to 21. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. 
And he said, good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, that is you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, then you shall, then you come to see my face. Who is Michael? Remember who Michael is? Goes way back. He was David's wife, or promise. David's first wife. Yeah. Saul's Saul's daughter, and 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 Saul gave Michael into David's hand back when he was worried about David. Um, thought he could make sure that David would be in good graces, but even more than that, uh, David had to do something to get her hand. He had to go do something to the Philistines. Oh, yeah. And he did. Master made a few of them, perhaps. Thousand foreskins of the oh, Philistines. Geez. And if you're going to do that, they're not going to stand by and idly let you do that. That means you have to kill them. So David fought hard for her. All right, go ahead there, Al. Then David sent messenger, messengers to Ishabeth. Saul's son saying, give me my wife, Michael, for whom I paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Barum. <coughs> then Abner said to him, go return, and he returned. Isn't that, how sad is that? Don't you feel, don't you feel for this guy? He loved her. And uh, Saul gave her to this man uh, when David became his enemy as a kind of another way to get back at David. So he didn't steal her. He was given to her and they lived together for a long time. I, I just, I'm, I feel bad. I, I feel very bad for him. It's like women being treated as castle, cattle being traded and not having value. Yeah. Looking at yeah, that's a good way to look at it from the other side. But just for him um, <laughs> to follow after her weeping, like a yeah, that, that's a sad. Masculine. Yep. All right. Go ahead there, Al. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, "For some time past, you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about, for the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David and Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with 20 men to David and Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to the Lord, the king, that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. So war has been going on, civil war. What looks like is going to happen now? If you were David, how would you be feeling about that? Pretty good. Pretty good. Put that arm on. <laughs> Let's turn to our uh, study guide. A3. <clears throat> and uh, we'll start with question 11. The Civil War wore on. During the seven years David waited in Hebron, he apparently married four four more wives. His family grew. Six sons were born in Hebron. God's plan for marriage is, put succinctly, one man and one woman united in a lifelong relationship. What negative effects do you think polygamy created in David's family emotionally and spiritually? <laughs> he had a lot of problems with his in-laws. <laughs> a lot of problems with his in-laws? What else? Jealousy. Jealousy Definitely them. jealousy. Yeah. Get all those women together. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and one will say, well, to the other one, well, he, David favors you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. it, it brings a lot of legitimacy into the question, too. Like, you're not really heir to the throne because of who your mother is. Now, my mother is so and so. So, a lot more infighting because of who's the legitimate heir to the throne. Oh, 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, pecking order even among the about among the wives. Yeah, there's only room for one woman at the stove. <laughs> And, and and is there is there bound to be favoritism? Oh yeah. Can we can we not avoid favoritism? Yeah. Even among your kids, don't you seem to tend that there's one for whatever reason? Maybe if with my parents, they loved my oldest daughter because they I remember they used to say something about the firstborn. That used to rake Susan and I. There's something special about all of them. There's something special about the firstborn. Just so there's no. Any middle children? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any middle children? Okay. Yeah, we can't avoid favoritism, can we? Um, that's more of a kind of emotional relationship. What about the spiritual aspect? Well, one of the wives did go through the faith. That's generally the way the kids are going to go through. Mm -hmm. Say that again. If one of the wives doesn't stay spiritually strong, chances are that the kids would probably not say anything. Yeah, yeah, there has to be a. It, there's yeah. been studies recently done. I mentioned this a while back, too. Uh, one of my other, other Bible studies. When. Uh, When neither parent goes to church, slim chance the kids will go to church later on in life. When mom goes and dad doesn't, a little bit better, but not much. When mom and dad both go, great. better. You want to know the greatest chance they found? When dad goes, yep. even if mom doesn't. Dad is the spiritual head of the household. If dad's going and mom's not, he's going to go. If mom's going, he might be going to go because he has faith, or he might just be going because mom, his wife, makes him get up and go. Makes me feel a lot better. And yeah. that's, that study that you mentioned, <clears throat> old enough that I remember that study's been replicated. In other words, they, they, they did similar studies over a few generations ago. It still holds true. That pattern has been found to be valid over several generations back then. I'm not saying that you should go and keep your wife home to make sure, <laughs> but if you're going to go because you have faith and, and you're the one, because it is your job, that's part of you as spiritual head of the house is to get everybody up and get them there. And it's your job to pray at meals. It's your job to institute Bible study. That's the father's job. And generally in our culture, the father doesn't do it. So if anybody does it, the mom has to, but because, and, and so behind that, God designed man to be the head of the household, didn't he? I have, I have an incident where in our household, when, no matter what time the kids come in on Saturday night, they got up and went to church. Well, I was up here hot and I got home at my daughter's house like at two o'clock in the morning. My daughter was standing at the door and she said, remember that, no matter what time you get home, you get up and go to church. <laughs> It's, it's part of the reason why we in the LCMS uh, stick with uh, males only as pastors. And it's not because uh, we're misogynistic. Adam was created first, and then Eve. Eve was not created to be a slave of Adam, but a helpmate. But that one law that they had, God told it to Adam. And Adam told it to Eve, because Adam was the spiritual head of the household. When sin happened, Eve took the fruit and ate it and gave it to Adam, right? Well, power. Power stirred. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> um, Eve took the fruit and gave it to Adam, but who did God come to when it was time to get confession? Adam. Who did he speak to? Adam, because Adam was the spiritual head of the household. Adam stood there and did nothing. When scripture talks about how we fell into sin, it doesn't mention Eve, it mentions Adam. Adam, Adam should have said, hey, Eve, this serpent talking ain't right. Let's go on. He should have knocked that fruit out of her hand. He stood there and did nothing. And not only did he do nothing, he who had received this commandment from the Lord took an ate. 
And from there, we always see man being the spiritual head of the house. And it's confirmed when you read Ephesians, when Paul talks about dynamic of the, of the household, men love your wives as Christ loves the church. The church is the bride, Christ is the husband, and that uh, relationship can only be understood or is best understood when God's design for men and women is played out, where the man sacrificially loves his wife, and then she comes underneath him and supports him in all he does because he's sacrificially loving her. When you don't follow God's will and design for things, what happens? They don't go well, do they? No, they don't go well. That doesn't mean when you follow God's will and design, things are perfect. No marriage and no family is perfect. Things generally go better, though. You try to oppose God's will to follow your own, and there'll be problems. Comments or questions on that? That's a, that's a tough topic as I get older and reflect on it. Like, as for another Bible study, is the gospel, uh, when, when a woman, because we had prophetesses women in the Bible, when a woman, LWML, when a woman speaks the gospel, when a woman proclaims God's word, Holy Spirit works through that woman, but she's not in the role of a pastor. Right. Yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting that's not worship, it's different. Um, what, we, we're, what we see in the LCFS is when we're in worship, it's corporate worship, pastor is the one, and it's a man. You notice uh, we don't uh, do, uh, we don't often allow people to come up and give their faith testimonies, right? Because worship time, we don't want to hear necessarily your take on, on spiritual things. We want to hear God's word. And so it's centered around God's word. And that's my job is when I preach, is this God's word, not just mine. So a woman can proclaim the gospel. And especially in a one-on-one -on -one setting, yeah, I don't see a reason why not. Yeah, I think it's their great. Not in, if I, we were Wells, if we were the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, it would, they would tell you we'll only go to women. But I think in a setting like here, Sharon, if you want to say a word of gospel, God bless you, go for it. Norma. Norma very well learned to train. I would never tell her to be quiet. In worship, though. In worship, it's different. At a woman's uh, meeting or Bible study or the Emma, you know, the mission group, uh, Marjorie told me they taught her that she delivers a, a, a gospel message spiritual message but it's not preaching but she delivers a message you know when they have their meetings and things and expound upon that they just call because she went to uh the uh michigan lutheran ministries institute uh, preaching school you know the the class we had and they said it's a spiritual message but it's not a presentation of the gospel that's how they you know <laughs> that's how we look at it kind of fuzzy but yeah, that's I, the reason we put these names on there. I think we're we try to be a too, little bit too pharisaic. Uh, I yeah. think I think Christ looks at a lot better. Good. Any other comments? Question twelve. Abner had set Ishbosheth up as a puppet king. Read verses 7 to 11 as we do so. Uh, think about this. The claim of king's concubine amounted to claiming the whole harem and therefore the throne. <laughs> no wonder Ishbosheth felt threatened and Abner outraged. How did God use the schemes of evil men to accomplish his eternal purpose? So back to 2 Samuel 3. Somebody care to read 7 through 11? Now Saul had a concubine named Rizpah, the daughter of Ahab. And Ishbemeth said to Abraham, Abner, why did you sleep with my father's con concubine? Abner was very angry because of what Isaac Beth said, and he said, Am I a dog's head on Judah's side? This very day I am loyal to the house of your father, Saul, and to his family and friends. I haven't handed 
you over to David yet, to David yet. Now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman. May God deal with Abner be ever so severely if I didn't, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him on oath, transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and establish David's, David's throne over Israel and Judah from the from Dan to the Stephen. Did not dare to say another word to Abner because he was afraid of him. The question before us how did God use the schemes of evil men to accomplish his eternal purposes? Who are the evil men involved in here, this little thing? Abner. Abner is definitely evil. And Ishmael, both of them. Yes. How do we know Abner is evil? Because he tried to choose. Ishmael of what his father's son. Yeah, she probably did it. Yeah. But he's he's uh, he's the whole he wants to be the power behind the throne. And as you're gonna find out, he knows that the Lord has anointed David as king. Yeah, he's trying to circumvent that. So he's uh he's not very faithful to the Lord. He's trying to get in good with him. So how did God use them? Made Abner mad, so he told him that he's going to make David. Yeah. I mean, we, we would like it to be that Abner came to faith and had this great realization and said, you know what? We need to follow God's will and make David king. That would have been a very righteous move on his part, but it's not. Does it amaze you that God works through evil people doing evil things? Yeah. Yeah. He can do anything he wants, can't he? Yep. It doesn't make sense to us. You're absolutely right. And we need to keep that in mind, too, when we see things going on, like even the war in the Ukraine, and it seems to be no hope. God can work through evil people. Right. And he can work doing evil things to do something that fits his will and is for the ultimate good of everybody. What happened to the sound? Reverend Art can't hear you. you yeah, no yes, word. Oh. Yeah. He was he was talking kind of quiet there, brother. He was saying he's uh, Gabriel has seen this very thing happen in his life where the Lord where the Lord works through evil people doing evil things, but does it for the good of those that he loves. All of us together. Correct. That that's his promise. He will work. He will work all things out for the good of those who love him according to his eternal purposes. And uh, the key there is, it's not what's best for me right now, but what will keep and make me remain in faith until life to come. Have, have that patience. Have patience. Have patience. Instead of trying to control myself, yeah. getting upset and everything, I said, I'll just sit back. Yeah. yeah. There's certain things that you can do, and, and certain things are out of your control. Stop being upset. Stop worrying. It's just melody. Yeah, he's got, yeah. Yeah, Gabriel. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a fresh air. It's very takes the load off his shoulders. Yeah. Nice let go. Let go. Yep, let go and let God. Yeah. Gabriel, we were talking last week that I think the company guys was like, David had to wait seven years with all the stuff going on before he was declared the real legitimate king because all this after stuff was going on. So God's will was finally done, but gee, he had to go through all this baloney for what, seven years was it? Yeah, something like that. So yes. you're right. Sometimes it, the, the good and gracious will of God, we're an immediate generation. We want God to take care of it uh, yeah. today. Yes. Okay. Uh, the patience that I know I'm going <laughs> to develop for this is very, you know, not to put it up. As we think about the dynamic between Abner and Ishbosheth, 
um, let's say Abner did actually sleep with Saul's concubine. What did he expect Ishbosheth? How did he expect Ishbosheth to react? How does it seem he expected him to react? Same potential was going to be over there. Yeah. He thinks Ishbosheth should have said, no problem, go ahead. Right. What's the deal? And what does that tell you about how Abner viewed himself in his power situation? Very high. Very high. Yeah. I put you in power, you're going to let me do what I want. Right. And I'll let you sit in the chair, Very and you can have the nameplate on the desk. Very but when it comes to what's going to happen, who pulls the strings? Yeah. Now, this is the guy that's going to go to David. So, um, question 13. Describe the diplomatic steps that advance the alliance between Abner and David. So we're asked to look at verse 12 first. Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. What's the first diplomatic step that happens here? Well, Abner sent the message. Abner reaches out to David. What does he mean, to whom does the land belong? What is he saying to David there? That the land did belong to you, and I will give it to you. This is your kingdom. As one anointed by the Lord, this, this kingdom belongs to you. I got it mixed up. Is it, is it Abner's, or is it uh, this, uh, this one? Right here? That's not why it's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's concerning David. I mean, really, it should be who does the land belong belongs to the Lord. <laughs> but then you, through that, David is the Lord's anointed. So make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel over to you. So who is David actually going to make the agreement with? But with God. That's kind of a concern, isn't it? From what we know about Abner. However, you think Abner might be in a position to fulfill what he's promising? Oh. Yeah. He is the power behind the throne. He was Saul's general. People look up to him. Maybe even people know if Bosheth is just a puppet king and they really know what position he holds. Verses uh, 13 to 16. And he said, good, I will make a covenant with you. This is David. Uh, but one thing I require of you is that you shall not see my face until you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, give me Michal, for I will pay the bridal price of 100 foreskins to the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took from her from her husband, Pathalel, son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping all the way to Bahurim. Then Abner said, go return, and he returned. Now, uh, then bring, uh, now then, oh, uh, Abner, okay, so what, what we have going on here, we said, with, with Mikhail coming, what does that do for David? We talk about that? Why, why do you think David wanted uh, Mikhail back? First of all, his first wife. Yeah, so could have been love still. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. Could have been love. Could have been love. But it's also it's his first wife, any offspring that came from that relationship. Like we discussed before, there was a pecking order. And those sons from Mikhail would have been first and foremost, I guess, in the line of succession. No, not just whose whose daughter was Mikhail? Or Michael. Saul. David married Michael. David married Michael. That means David married into the family of Saul. Saul. So that connects David with the family of Saul, who yes. was king. Yes. Does that work to solidify David's yes. continuity of the throne? Yeah. I think that's the reason why he wanted her back. Yeah, so and it would it would it would not not just for his own personal ego, but it would go a ways to help heal the rift between Judah and the other tribes. Also, 
Should David just openly trust Abner? No. <laughs> Notice David says, before we meet face to face, do this. So if, if uh, Abner follows through on this, what does that tell David? He can be a little bit trusted. Yeah. He, he really wants to do this. He really wants to have a covenant. Because why might Abner say he wants to meet with David, but not really want to meet with him? Why might Abner want to see David face to face? Shove the spear into his stomach, kill him like uh, uh, Abner did uh, Joab's uh, uh, nephew who was running after him. It's kind of a, a good a goodwill kind of thing. Show me that you really want to meet for peaceful reasons. Now, David's not going to meet with him one-on-one -on -one by himself. He's going to have his, his mighty men, his dudes around him to protect him. But David's not stupid. So that's all part of this diplomatic thing that's going on, isn't it? Also, that Hebron might think that David might make him second. Well, there's a good thing, isn't it? We know that Abner likes power. Yeah. And uh, this Ishbosheth has made him mad. So this way, if Abner does this, he might gain a position with David. Problem is, David's already got a general named Joab. But yeah, I would I, I, be a little bit lower down the pecking. <laughs> Joab might be, Abner might be a little higher if he could do this. Yeah. Is David, you think, anxious for the Civil War to end? He didn't want to in the first place. Right. That's why he waited for seven years. Right. I think it's interesting that he doesn't show and he doesn't quite trust him. Is that David himself sent them a message to um, King? Yeah, Ishbosheth. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good catch. Make sure, are you on board with this? You know? Abner says, I can have my wife back. Are you on board with this? Send me my he does, and okay, and there's civil war going on between these two kings, and what does Eshmael Shep do? He doesn't. He really doesn't have any power. He's kind of spineless here. Maybe Eshmael Shep realizes he's on the way out. If Abner's switching sides, it's so, over. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. kind of over here. So, Michael or Michael or whatever her name is, she comes. Uh, verse 17, and Abner conferred with the elders of Israel saying, for some time past, you have been seeking David as king over you. Now, then, bring it about. For the Lord has promised David saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner talking to the other tribes of Israel, what does he say? What does he say they've been seeking? For some time past, you have been seeking David as king over you. So even according to Abner, even these other tribes have been kind of wanting and wishing that David was king. And, and what is Abner's uh, reason for that? Does he mention anything about the Lord's anointed? No. What does he say is the reason? by the hand so it's David is God's man to save people from the Philistines and from their enemies and would all of Israel have seen David in this light no. remember back before David became uh, persona non one before he became uh, for, before Saul went after him what, what was it they were singing when David walked into town with Saul? Saul killed his thousands. David has ten yeah. thousands. Yeah. They see him as a mighty man of war, don't they? Yes. As a great general who's proven himself in battle. Before he had to take off running, I mean, he killed a uh, hundred Philistines just to get their foreskins. They, they see him. Yeah. They, they would definitely believe that if there's a guy that could defeat, because who's left? Who's left to fight? Saul's dead. All of his sons are deaf except for the spineless wimp, Ishbosheth. The army's decimated. Are they looking for some help against the Philistines? 
Yeah. Yeah. They've been dealt a very, very wicked blow by these Philistines, and they would be looking for somebody to lead them, clear the Philistines out, and establish them once again as the nation that God intended them to be in the promise. Questions or comments up till now? I know nothing before any of this is going to take place. But yeah, I'm trying to find what we're learning right now and what you did, you know, the stuff before with the uh, anything before three. I know I didn't just yeah, I, I'm trying to fill you in a little bit on where, where we're at. Thank you. Do you get a chance to go back and read uh, through uh, First Samuel, uh, starting at like chapter 15? I'll try. Or when you get a chance. I'm just retaining it and for it to stay being here and learning like this. Yeah. It, it's it's a, a the story of Saul and of David and everything is a very interesting story. So, and we're kind of stepping into the middle part of it here. So Abner goes and talks to the elders of Israel. He says, hey, remember, you guys thought David is the man. And guess what? David can be the man. Uh, and then Abner spoke to Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. And, Ab, and, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron that all Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought what thought it was good to do. Um, Benjamin here is mentioned separately because Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So if anybody's going to stay faithful to the line of Saul, it would be the Benjamites. And so Abner makes a special trip. Faithy, I know. to see you. Well, we need to go to the dentist, so I'm God's saying she got me up here. So Faith, this is uh, Gabriel. Hi, Gabriel. Gabriel, nice to meet you. We, we've been floundering because we did not have faith. Now we have faith. Okay. And it was a water pump. Oh, so, that's not bad. Yeah. Good. And we got the $300. Yay! We, we prayed for that, by the way. Good. Yeah. I was praying, too. I bet you were. So, so um, get back to our study. Abner goes to Benjamin. It's the Benjamites on board. They would have maybe been the last holdout to David being king. And then what does Abner say to David? Who's behind you becoming king? All Israel, including Benjamin. It's a literally Benjamites. Yeah. Benjamin is the name. I mean, so it would be the, the Judaites would be people from Judah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, where it says here, uh, all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba was in the south, the southern part of Judah. Dan was the northernmost tribe up north before you hit Syria. So Dan to Beersheba means the whole entire land that God promised to the Israelites. That's what that means. All right. Uh, diplomatic steps. So that was the next step. Abner does consolidate. All of those that would be standing opposed to uh, to David, hey, they all want you to be king, and I can bring them on board, and I've done that. I've been the emissary to them. Meanwhile, Abner's really not a man of God. He's almost like a politician. He's having all this stuff happen. Maybe God is working through Abner, but Abner's not sitting back and saying, ah, this is what God wants. This is God's plan for me, and Yes, he, he, he has no realization, I don't think, that uh, of what God's plan is or anything. God may be using Abner, but he's a... He's totally in the dark. Totally, yeah. He, he, yeah, good point, Al. He might know that, that David's the Lord's anointed, but that doesn't mean the same thing to Abner as it does to David. My take is today, we have a lot of stuff going on in the world. We have a lot of politicians. We have a lot of spokespeople. Many who may never know God or Jesus. But yet, God may still be working with them and through them. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And sometimes we don't understand it, but we need to understand that God is. And there's this too, politicians saying when something happens like the shooting in Uvalde in the, in the school, I'll pray for you. Really? <laughs> Who are you praying to? I'm just curious. Who are you praying to? <laughs> it is amazing that how many times... Um, as politicians, you know, they're all against praying and carrying on, but yet it's okay. You know, it's like, yeah, we have to take that stuff off the courthouse and stuff because Ten Commandments is too Christian and, 
to this, to that, but at the same time, they'll open certain meetings with a prayer. And I'm like, it makes no sense. Kind of victim, so. to, to say I'll pray for you, I think it, it's got to be, it's a byword. It's like, my heart goes out to you. I feel sorry for you. It's another way to say that. Yeah. You're and in my thoughts. Say that. Right. They, they, they say, you're in my thoughts and prayers. Why don't you just knock the prayer thing off and you say in your thoughts? Because I don't truly believe you are praying. And if you are, you're not praying to the triune God, which means you're praying to Satan. You're not praying to anybody. You're talking in the wind. Good catch. All right. You're good catch though, Al. Yeah, he's he's definitely doing this for his own. Well, you know, he might want to see the end of the Civil War too. Yeah. But he could see the end of the Civil War and get his position with higher. David, who David higher. he knows he's got to respect David. David actually is a king. He's not a wimp like this Ishbosheth. Yeah. And Abner would like to see a king that could lead them into battle, could coalesce all of Israel. Abner probably wants to see the Philistines defeated. I was probably also was thinking if I could do this to David, I might get a good position. Yeah. Yeah. Might be the hip general. Yeah. So now let's look at verses 20 and 21. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. Um, why would a feast be important? Shows fellowship with him. Yeah. Very good, Reverend Art. You didn't eat with your enemies back then. Oh. So having a fellowship meal, this means we are now no longer enemies. We're friends. Is that true today, too? Yes. Pretty Is, much. And you see, that's the reason why we have fellowship hour after worship. Yes. We sit down as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And enjoy each other's company. And it doesn't have to be a full blown meal, but I believe having something to eat is very important. God's designed us that way. When we share food, it increases our feelings of fellowship with one another. There's just something about that. Like when we have Bible study and Tom brings in lemon cake, like he promised last Sunday. Hence, oh, hence, oh, hence, oh. Hence. I'm looking. <laughs> No, I don't see any. <laughs> no. We should have told them to turn right back around and head back out. No, come out. <laughs> I'm just going to buy him a bag of lemons for the hint. Yeah. Tom, I'm, you don't have. I'm not. I'm We're just, teasing. Yeah. You know, there's something, there is something to that, though, because we don't do it often, but it seems like, you know what? I want to take something in. I don't care. Maybe if it's just some cookies. The donuts are out. As much as I love Donna's donuts, and how, and as much as I love all of you, the I can make pie price. for the next year for what it costs me. <laughs> it's, um, it's ridiculous. A dozen and a half yeah. of donuts. They are good, but man, are they rich? Yeah, I get fat. I get fat just looking at them. <laughs> that's what happens. You look at too many donuts. That's, yeah. just, that's my problem. I don't really need them. So that's 20, uh, 21. And Abner said to David, this is his response to the fellowship meal and all that's happened. So Abner responds to David, I will arise and go and I will gather all Israel to my Lord, the king, and they will make a covenant with you that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So Abner's going to get up. He's going to arrange for all of Israel to come. And what do you think is going to happen? What, what is going to be part of this covenant? What will we call that when somebody becomes king? Coronation. Coronation, yeah. It's a coronation be there to support it and witness it and say yes David you are our king sounds good doesn't it this is important so David sent Abner away and he went in peace which means David said he is not to be touched don't attack him let him return to his capital and his thing important to remember that Question 14, challenge question. David's goodwill, patience, and generosity showed his willingness to make peace. How does David's behavior prove that he truly desired to do God's will? He, he was willing, yeah, he was willing to accept Abner. Hear what he had to say? 
open the door for him instead of just saying, get out of here or have Abner come and what could have David have done? Hold it off. Think about leading up to this. And Al, you brought this up. Seven years, David was king over Judah and waiting. What does that show us about uh, his patience, generosity, his willingness to make peace, his willingness to follow the Lord? Think how long, it's, and it's not just the seven years he ruled in Hebron. It was all those years he was in the wilderness running from Saul going all the way back when he was a little boy and or a teenager or whatever the heck he was and, and he was anointed by Samuel. Going all the way back there, he was promised the kingdom. And all of this time, he's been waiting. <coughs> if you think God is making you wait, and you're having trouble with patience, think about how long David had to wait. <laughs> Think Go about ahead. the people in the in the desert for 40 years. David knew that too. He said, Well, I'll just wait on the Lord. How about um Abraham? Yeah. How long did he have to wait for a son? And God kept up the promise. About You're gonna be the father years. of a great nation. And <laughs> Abraham could say, Yeah, really? Well, where is it? <laughs> We're still barren here, Lord. It ain't working. Not getting getting older. Getting older. <laughs> To, to the point, and this was God's God's thing, to the point where Abraham and Sarah had children, it would have been, by all means and standards, even today, physically impossible for them to conceive and have a child. They were that old. I just think about my parents. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, I can't imagine my parents having kids at this age. Well, and even if you got pregnant, having a healthy child, giving birth, going through the whole process. Yeah, but when you're 89 and 90, you don't you're usually not capable of having kids. Nope. And, and so in, in Abraham's case, what did that show Abraham, Sarah, and all that came after? What was Isaac? A miracle. A miracle, child of the promise. Is anything too impossible or too hard for the Lord? Jesus no. asked no. Nothing is. And perhaps David learned that and was standing by that. And now David's about to see it's going to actually come. <coughs> Questions or comments before we move on to the next set of verses? Sure, it shows David had a strong faith. <coughs> Was he perfect? No. Even people with a strong faith can our fall sinful. back, our sinful. fall away, be sinful. Well, David asked for Saul's daughter and she was married. Yeah. Now, how's that set in there? He's committing adultery. He's marrying another man's wife. <laughs> Take, taking another man. <laughs> Although it was originally his. Yeah. But yeah, and then that ties in with uh, all the wives that David had previously. She must have been a looker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he there and there that shows you his sinful faults. He is a man of God. In fact, God said, A man after my own heart. But uh, David definitely wasn't perfect, not at all. And he had his sinful hang ups and problems. And uh, as your pastor preached on last Sunday, every single one of us has something we struggle with. I firmly believe that. And you might be the only one that knows that, but we all have something that we wish was not true about us a personality flaw, a trait. Thoughts, actions, words that we just come out of our mouth when they shouldn't, whatever it is, don't know you're not the only one. Every single person struggles with it and finds ourselves often in prayer saying, Lord, I'm sorry this happened. Can you please take this away from me? And you end up struggling with it the next day. But don't think that the Lord's ready to cast you out from his presence. He's not. He wants you to struggle with it. And we struggle with it whenever we come before him and confess it to him and believe his words of absolution that we are indeed forgiven, not because we successfully fought this temptation or thing, but because of God's grace in Jesus Christ. As long as you're struggling with it, you never want to get to the point where you say, well, I can't defeat it, so what? What the heck? David was a sinner. What the heck? You don't want to go there. Because that's the slippery slope out of faith and into being lost. As long as it bothers you and you're struggling with it, 
you're good. But never turn the corner and say, well, David or Christ died for me, so it's okay for me to do this. You don't want to do that. Struggle with it. And you're going to struggle with it the rest of your life, but when will you stop struggling with it? When you're in heaven. When Christ returns, yep, when you're in heaven, when your soul's with Jesus in heaven, but when you're restored, body and soul, and standing before him in the new heaven and the new earth, all those, whatever that is in you or whatever those things are in you will be completely gone and you'll never deal with them again. You'll never have that temptation again. You'll never have that one little thing that will be gone. So you, it is, it's awesome. You will be the you that you always wanted to be and even beyond that, the you that you never knew you could be. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Tom, did you have something? I was going to say, I think when we get to the point where, you know, that we're in eternal life, it won't make any difference. I don't think we're going to reflect back on me. Are we? No tears. All tears are wiped away. So whatever caused you tears and sorrow won't be remembered or it won't cause you tears and sorrows anymore. I think you reflect on it. We will we will see God's judgment and completely agree with it. And that's uh, this was a question asked me long ago by somebody who said, "My dad, I know my dad died out of faith. He refused to believe to the end of his life. How can I be happy in eternal life when I know my dad's not there?" And uh, I pondered that, and I talked with him about my pastor with about that, and he had a great answer. He said. When that man gets to eternal life, he'll agree with God's judgment. He'll agree why his father's not in heaven, and he'll understand. You will be completely aligned fully with God's will. You'll be happy. It's hard for us to believe here now. It's very hard. That's because we still, part of us still fights against God's will. You know, if, if you love, if you have a loved one who died out of faith, I mean, don't, don't, why aren't you saying to God, just make an exception. Come on, give him give a pass. Or why didn't you change him before he died? And none of those things will be issues when you stand with Jesus in eternal life. You'll be completely in line with how things happened, what God did, and what that person did to earn eternal damnation. And we don't have the mindset to comprehend that now. Tom? Huh? I was going to say, even as we sit here, I can't read the heart of another man. So therefore, at that final moment, it is not to me to say, oh yeah, they did, or oh no, they didn't. I think that I can be satisfied with the fact that God's going to deal with them. I guess in a way, kind of let the chips fall where they will. There's many times I've thought to myself, I'm glad I don't have to make the choice. I'm glad that's up to God, not me. Yep. Do you want to make the choice for me? I don't want to make the choice for you. Exactly. See, that's a true way. And it's people that you love or care about that are living outside of God's law. And even though we all sin, it's a hard one sometimes. So it's like, hey, that's that's up to God. It's not up to me. And there's something about knowing that sometimes our loved ones, when we know that they're baptized children, you can hold fast to the thing that the Holy Spirit has always had a chance to work. Now, they can, they can throw it out the window, but the Holy Spirit is still there in their heart. Whenever the gospel is preached, the uh, gift of eternal salvation is presented in your life. And uh, you have no choice. You believe because it's presented. The choice you do have is you can say, I don't need it for whatever reason. I'm, I'm going to be right on my own with Jesus. And with God, I don't need Jesus' help. Or I don't care. I don't believe there's a God, or since Jesus being Savior means he has to be Lord, I don't want a Lord over my life. I rule myself, and I'm damn well happy with it. All of those things are taking the gospel and throwing them out the window. And 
That's presented to you every time you hear the gospel. So people can do that over and over and over again. And still the Lord is gracious because he desires all people to be saved. That gospel will be presented to you again. And again. And that's why we come. come. That's what doesn't force us to come back. It prompts us to say, I need to be there. Or, or I want to be there. Good stuff. Any other comments or questions? Any comments? What do you say we try to dive into a little bit to 2 Samuel 3, 22 to 29? I don't know that we'll get uh, into the questions, but we can at least start reading the scripture, and then we'll come back and pick it up next uh, week, okay? In other words, it has to go We successfully got through a day, a day three. Okay. Which is amazing for us. Okay. It's, amazing. <laughs> it's a God thing. It's because it's because we have an angel here. I was wondering if it's because my head is not here. No, it is. We get <laughs> with you in faith, with you in faith, we're gonna rock. <laughs> uh, let's um, let's read um, uh, Second Samuel three verses twenty two to twenty five. Just then, the servants of Jacob arrived. With Joab from a raid, bringing much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone to peace. And Joab, and all the army uh, that was with him, came with Joab. Abner, the son of David, of Ner, came with him, and he let him go, and he has gone to peace. You said that. Uh, to 20, no. 20, no, uh, 25. 25. And Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he is gone? Know that Abner, the son of Mary, came to deceive you to know your own covenant. No, all that you are doing. All right, so <clears throat> Abner leaves. And remember, how did Abner leave? What did David grant him? Peace. Peace, which basically this man is not to be touched. After he leaves, Joab comes. Joab and his men weren't there. They come. And how does Joab react when he finds out Abner's been there? Kind of upset. He's pissed. Yeah. And why? Why is he pissed? What did he think David should have done? Killed him. Yeah. Killed him or kept him there. And I'll kill him. Well, wasn't there bad blood because it wasn't someone killed even uh, one of the family? Maybe a, something. There was a. There was maybe killed his brother or something. Abner. So there. Ab Abner. Blood. Abner kills. Uh, um. Yeah, it was Joab's brother, I believe. Uh -huh. Younger brother, or cousin. So there's a blood relation. Oh, there's bad so, like, blood. He killed my brother or my cousin or something. So like I, the and the boy. Exactly. So there was some work. Work. Oh yeah, there's there's big problems here. But what does Joab first mention? Does he mention that? Why does he why does he think that David should have uh, made sure he stayed? Or is it, what is what is Joab saying? Is it, is it so much that David didn't keep him there? What's Joab's big problem? Don't came to spy on. Yeah, don't you know he came to spy on you? Did he have plans against you? I know everything that you know. He doesn't want to make peace, David. Come on, this is Abner. And from what we know of Abner, are those suspicions maybe kind of valid? Yeah. Yeah, he's not a godly man. I think he truly does want peace. Does Joab know all of the steps that Abner has gone to to try to uh, make this covenant and stop the civil war? No. He just blunders in, finds out Abner was here, and he flies off his nut. And Joab was a military person, and he just got back from battle. So he's pumped up. He's he's a military man. Yes. He's, he's used to fighting guys like Abner. And has fought against him. Yes. And like you said, he did not know all this other stuff that was going on. No communication there. Joab is not wasn't born yesterday. 
Maybe he knows a little bit about Abner's personality. What do you think he might suspect for being Abner's reason for even coming and trying to set this covenant up? To gain a place sure. in David's kingdom? And how might that affect Joab? Why might he not want to see Abner have a place in David's kingdom? Well, he just realized to be where Joab yeah, take Abner, Abner. Take Joab's job. He'd say, hey, wait a minute, I'm the I'm sitting with the uh, I'm, I'm the right hand. I'm the right hand. I'm the right hand. Now. Don't come yeah. take my place. So. Yeah. Can you understand? There's a number of reasons why Joab would be very upset about this. Yeah. Good. Um, let's read on uh, verse 26 all the way to 39. Which I think is Side into the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. <coughs> Afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord. For the blood of Abner, the son of Ner, many in May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has the discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls on the sword or who lacks bread. Brother, Asa holds his death in the battle. David lets Abner go in peace. Joab comes, finds out what David did. Yes. Leaves David's presence, and what does he do? And the king said he's not to be touched. Abner calls him back, or Joab calls him back under the premise of what? There's something they need to talk about, right? Maybe Abner thinks it has something to do with this covenant that they're making. Maybe even Joab wants to kind of hash it out. I'm still going to be the right-hand man. You could be the second right-hand man. Does Abner think anything bad is going to happen? No. Covenant's under the protection. So meets him at the gate, which is often where business was done in a city. You did it at the gate. Calls him off to the side to have a private conversation and does what? In the stump. How did Asahal die? His brother, do you remember? Spear in the stomach. Spear in the stomach. Which end of the spear? Back oh, end. That's the back end of the spear, remember? Yeah. Not the sharp end. Abner's running. Asahal is running behind him. Abner turns around and says, Hey, go after one of these younger guys. Meaning that I'm an experienced veteran soldier. And, and if you mess with me, you're going to die. I'll have to kill you. And Asahal didn't. He was mad. He had blood loss. Perhaps he even wanted a name for himself. He's the one that killed Saul's general. And so he's running, probably running pretty fast. Abner sticks the butt end of the spear out, which to me, if he wanted to kill him, would he use the sharp end? That's going to go right in. Perhaps Abner only meant to knock the wind out of him. But as it turned out, right through it, which had to be so painful. That was a hard blow. For the butt end of the spear, that's not sharp to go right through it. And so Abner ends up dying at the hands of Joab in, in revenge of his brother the same way. Not with the butt end of a spear, but with a knife or something in the middle of his stomach. David hears about it, and what, how does David feel about this? He's kind of upset. He's upset. He says, my kingdom, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord. Why would he be worried about that? 
he thought maybe the people thought that he had ordered this. What has David been trying to do here? He's trying to make peace. He's trying to bring the kingdom together. And it's in a very precarious situation, isn't it? The whole nation of Israel has, has, has agreed to make him king, but it hasn't happened yet. But it's about to. And on the verge of all of this happening, so there's been kind of a truce call between the north and the south. If, if this were today, the major news networks would be saying, what's with David? He has no control over his, his people. And he can't be trusted. You know, Dave, David, could he be our king? Look, he, does, he can't control his own people. Like you said, he can't be trusted. He, uh, his, he's got infighting with his own head leaders. It's very much disorganized. I don't think this guy could be a good leader. That's great catch. That is the big problem. He, he can't control his people. David said he's not to be touched. And David's second in command violates that order and kills him. No credibility as a future leader. Now, this didn't happen in battle, right? No. Abner no. and Joab weren't in battle. So what would we call this? Murder. 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 First degree murder. murder. And, and what, what should the consequence even back the even then be for first degree murder? No. Stone to death. For death. Stone to death. Do you see, I mean, we haven't read all the way through, but do you see David doing that? No. I'll tell you, he's not going to. And that's a problem. But David does go to lengths to do what before the northern kingdom and before everybody? Peace. Proclaim his innocence. This was not my order. This was not my doing. I didn't want this to happen. In fact, I'm upset about it. And as you read on, you're going to find David's actually going to be part of the funeral procession. He's going to don sackcloth and ashes and mourn for Abner, who in some respects before this was his enemy. David is doing this probably because he does feel guilty in his heart. He's a man of God, but also he's trying to keep this unsteady, newfound alliance together. We're going to leave it there. Questions or comments, though, up until now? What do you think the relationship is going to be between Joab and... Uh, David going forward here. Not good. I don't know that I, I would trust him again. No. If I was David. No. However, however, Joab is uh, his general and very good at it. And, and as we'll see, that's perhaps one of the reasons why David doesn't put him to death. I bet he keeps it sharp eye <laughs> Good thought. Good thought. We we'll, we'll read. Uh, David has a, a special wish for his son Solomon as he's about to die, concerning Joab. And we'll leave it there. We'll look at that next time. Next week, a little teaser there. Tune in next week, same time, same place. <laughs> Good study, isn't it? Yeah. And and it's kind of like you know a, a, a soap opera, isn't it? We're just. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've got Where do you the, think they came up with the idea? Yeah. We've got a dude having sex with a lot of women that he shouldn't. We've got murder, we've got hatred. We've got what looks like a solution, and then right after that, things fall awry. Great plot line. But he's got a great sponsor. He does. The Lord. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord does have it all in hand, and we know how it's going to turn out. What is David? eventually going to be king good. he'll be king of israel and the lord will work it out despite all of these things and all of these problems and that's you know right along with what you said patience things look like they're turning sour sour lord how can it happen now well it is going to happen and he's got it in control none of these things god didn't say oh gosh joab did that Oh, crap, now I've got to fix this. No, that's never what God said. He knew it was going to happen, and it was still going to work out according to his plan. But God also tells us 
when you ask for forgiveness, your sins are forgiven and they are taken as far as the east is from the west, never to be recalled. So that means God doesn't remember all this stuff when David says, forgive me for this here stuff. Great point, Reverend Art, because how do we forgive each other? That's right. Ron, I forgive you, but I'm still going to remember how you euchred me. <laughs> you can't do it. You I didn't think so. No, wait, you really didn't play with me, did you? No, no, no. That was I Ellie. You. Ellie's the one that kept uh, Trump at all. Ellie and I. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Here's another. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Well, what's wrong with that? As long as you got Trump. That's all I had. <laughs> yeah, you're the one, Faithy. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for reminding me. But great, great uh, point. Is it? He only won one game. I only won one game. But isn't that how we forget? There's always a lot of times, there's always that little remembrance there. Somewhere there's like a little uh, a scoreboard. Well, I'll forgive you. But now you owe me one. Then you get back into an argument and you say, remember this when you did that, John? I did that when uh, John and I get in a fight. And I'm like, yeah, well, I remember. That's, that's a bad thing to do. God doesn't forget that way. And that's very hard for us to understand. And, and uh, uh, who, who brought that up? East, just in the West. Is that you? Pastor. Yeah, that, oh, Reverend Art. That's a great point because we, we need to have that pounded in our ears again and again. God doesn't remember them. They're gone. He doesn't hold a grudge. He forgets. He doesn't remember. Sin is covered, completely covered by Christ. And ponder that. It's, it's an amazing thing that you can ponder every day, how God can forgive that completely, yet he does because that's who he is. That's what Christ came to do for us. Thank you, Reverend Art. You're welcome, sir. You brought that around great. A great way to end the Bible study. We're, we're with Jesus and forgiveness. And let's leave it there and uh, let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, that is how you forgive, completely. No strings attached. And you keep forgiving. Even as we keep sinning, you keep forgiving over and over again. Thank you, Lord. Continue that work in my life and in the life of each person here. May they know that forgiveness. Even though we can't understand it, and we might doubt it at times, impress that upon our hearts and lives as you work through your word and work through our lives through your spirit. Gather us together again to, uh, next week to continue to study your word and this Sunday to be in your presence as we worship you. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, thank you. Good study. Yeah. I'll have a great day. And to those of you that can, I'll see you at 7 o'clock tonight. We'll study Revelation and all the scary stuff. Yeah. Has it been that scary? No. 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 It's very interesting. Yeah. I don't think it's scary anymore. No, it's not. Uh, all the scary scary stuff that it's mentioned, it's going on out there in the world right now. Right. If you want to be scared, just read the news. It's all going to be scary. God's blessings, everyone. We'll see you again. Peace with you. And also with you.